Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. Um, I didn't make these slides, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, no, so I, I'm actually borrowing somebody else's slides. Totally, 100% honest with you. Um, I didn't make any slides specifically for this because Phil contacted me the other day. Like, hey, since you're coming down, do you mind talking at the security end? I'm not sure. Um, so as as Phil said, uh, and Phil and I have known each other for probably 15, close to 20 years at this point. Um, I did at one point go to work for a little company called Sourcefire, and uh, you know, because for some reason I took an interest in this little project called Snort. And sort, little anybody thing. Um, and so, Sourcefire heard of me. I started working with when we were when I was with Phil at the Arsenal down here at Fort Gordon. And Sourcefire heard of what I had built at the Army, probably because they couldn't sell into the Army because of what I built, which was kind of a sales problem. But um, so they decided to, to hire me and. So I came to work at Sourcefire back in 2005, and I've been with them ever since, um, even through the acquisition of Cisco. So the what I've been able to do since I've been there is I've worked in professional services for a bunch of years. Then I worked, I moved over into uh, show of hands. Everybody, anybody have ever heard of the acronym VRT? A couple of you, right? So I moved over to VRT. About five years later, in 2010, started to draw fight and store rules, and then following the acquisition of uh, of Sourcefire and Cisco, we formed a group called Talos. Some of you may have heard that, hopefully, at this point. And uh, I'm one of the senior managers in Talos now. So, uh, all the while, I've been the community manager for Snort. And since during, the, I give a little bit of history to kind of build up to where I'm going. Uh, at the latter, at, latter end of Sourcefire's run, before the acquisition, we were starting to think about how we wanted to evolve open source within the company. And we wanted to start, so Sourcefire was started on Snort, right? It's the kind of the backbone of the company. And then, you know, marketing owned the marketing aspects <coughs> of Snort, the branding of Snort, and, you know, the web team owned the website, so then, you know, this team on that, and this team on that, and then I was a community manager. So we decided when we were acquiring the system to consolidate that all. So now I run everything here, except for development, but I run everything here. Um, I also run everything Clan AB, if you guys have heard of that, oh, I gotta stay within the camera. I pace a lot, so I apologize that you're fine. Uh, I also run the Claim AV project, if you've ever heard of Claim AV, um, and some various other small projects. But uh, now that we're acquired by Cisco, kind of by my job since I've come on board, is they've actually figured out that we at Sourcefire knew something about open source and how to grow that. And so I've kind of been charged with doing the same thing within Cisco, with growing Cisco's open source presence and things like that. So that's a little bit of background about who I am. Um, but the title of this talk is Snort and kind of history and, and where we're going with it. So I figured I would vamp for about 45 minutes on Snort. Um, so when I joined Sourcefire back in 2005, uh, my first week of work was out at Linux World, the last Linux World conference there ever was. I like to say that you know I shut it down. It was, you know, couldn't handle it anymore. Joel and Ryan. No. Um, so it was the last Linux World Conference there was, I, you know, we went there and I was, it was my first day of work. I didn't know what to expect, you know. I'm here at a Snort booth and I know a little bit about Snort. I work for the company, but, you know, I know how to write a couple of rules, but I know how to configure this, that, and the other thing, but what am I doing here representing Snort? I have absolutely no idea. Um, but somehow I wound up my first week of work being in San Francisco, California at the Moscone Center at Linux World. So, um, and I'm sitting there, and for those of you who have never heard of Marty Rash, who's the founder of Sourcefire and he started the story, um, I was like a total little fanboy. It's like meeting Steve Jobs, if you're an Apple dude, it's like, it's the guy that wrote the story. And so I'm sitting there. <laughs> 
I was sitting there at Starbucks, right, and I see him walking across the, the if you've ever been to San Francisco, it's like the Yerba, Yerba Buena Gardens, right? He's walking across the Yerba Buena Gardens towards me. I'm sitting there at the Starbucks, and I'm like, what God's support. <laughs> Stupid story. But anyway, it was, it, was, it was just funny because then, like, you know, we're sitting there, and we go, to, go over to the booth, and he's sitting there. We're sitting there talking about story. And I'm looking over his shoulder, and he's sitting there on his MacBook cranking away at this code. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm right to start three. It's 2005. So, I told you this was going on. So that's where I first saw start three. And I, got, I was asking questions about like, what, you know, what's the vision for start three? And, you know, what's the, what do you want to do? What do we want to change? Things like that. And, well, we want to make it multi-thread. We want to make it multi-core. We want to be able to, you know, uh, Farm things out across different boxes. We want to have uh, a configuration that we don't have to change. We can change it in real time. We don't have to stop, start, and restart it every time we want to do something, right? If you want to insert a new rule, we won't have to shut it down and restart it. Doug's nodding at me like, yeah, I wish you guys would fix that. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, so I was like, man, this is a great idea. I'm like, what, what are you writing it in? Like, well, I'm writing it in C. I'm like, well, how do you do the configuration? Well, that's all in Lua. I'm like, Go on Lua, all right? So, um, you know, it's kind of the beginning of the origin story of, of Start 3. And then uh, several years later, probably two or three years later, we got to the point where it was code stable and we wanted to start performance testing it. And so we started performance testing it and we actually found out it was slower than regular restore because of the way that we were doing it, right? Um, you know, that's where we kind of came across the, the um, perception of the misconception that multi-core is not necessarily faster. Just because you say multi-core doesn't mean it's faster, right? So we kind of came across that perception and we proved it over and over again and we're like, okay, well, how do we do this with the vision of, you know, processors aren't getting any faster, really, even though, you know, they kind of are, but you guys remember, like, the Pentium went to a certain point, and then they you know, made the chips smaller, so you put more chips, you know, so it was, oh, we need to, you know, uh, put more chips on one die and things like that. So it was, it was more about um, being able to utilize all of those processes at one time. And so what we found out is when you're analyzing a single thread, you want to you packet, processing, packet processing across a single thread. If you have to exit a core to go to a different core, or if you have to go you know, out of one core into a different core across a front side bus, or God forbid you should go between two separate processes, right? That process was incredibly insane. And then somebody had a brand new, it was like, oh, let's, let's farm things out to the GPU, because that'll be, no, that's even longer, like, get the, get the motherboard, like, what are you thinking? So we're talking about, like, real time, right? We have to do stuff in sub microsecond, right? So the IPS, it has to be operate in real time. So, after we performance tested it, we found out that it was actually a complete disaster area, so we stopped. And that's where Stork 3 was for many years, because we just stopped. And at that same time, Sourcefire was going public, we decided to write, you know, we came out with RNA, we came out, we're going to make it a uh, next generation firewall, we acquired Immunet, right? So it was like all these things that kind of compounded. Well, about five, six years ago, it was well after Suricata came out, and it was well after, there was something else that came out around that same time, but it was well after all these things came out, and we decided, we, we had hit, we're, you know, with our, with SourceFire hardware, before we were acquired by Cisco, with SourceFire hard, hardware, we were hitting a theoretical limit, and it was around 180 gigs a second, right? And while that seems like incredibly fast, when you're talking about selling into the service provider market, you know, you have to be able to go much, much faster than that. So, um, you know, we were, we were hitting about 180 gig a second here, I think, with it. And that, we knew we needed to break through that, and we knew that we needed to prepare for the future. So, there was a meeting between, you know, the VP of development and the director of development, and Marty and myself, and kind of the head developer at the time, and we said, look, remember Stork 3? <laughs> We need to start all over again. Start from scratch, completely rewrite everything that we thought of, and do it right the first time. 
uh, using all the knowledge that we've learned over the years. So that's what we did. So we sat down, we completely rewrote it. Um, there's actually no copy code from anything in that in store in the new sort three. There's no sort two. There's no legacy sort three. But um, we brought all that code over, or uh, we didn't bring any code. Over. We started writing again. We carved off like two or three people from our development organization, which, by the way, at the time was only six people. This is a true story. Sourcefire's development organization that worked on the IPS before we were fired by Cisco was six people. You think like, oh, Sourcefire's massive company, six people wrote the IPS. Um, so we carved off like three of those six. And we're like, look, you know, these three are going to maintain the store two X code tree. These three are going to work on the future. And so now that we're fired by Cisco, we were able to add a whole bunch of people to that team. And some of it's in India and some of it's here, and we've been able to grow that team quite substantially. I say all that to say the reasons that we wanted to build Snort 3. Speed, obviously an issue, right? You have, to, you have to get beyond the limits of where we were at. We wanted to preserve memory, because in order for you to multi-core Snort, you have to run an instance of Snort on every core. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever done this but it's a pain in the butt to configure and keep up running, right? So you have to have a separate store.com for each <coughs> core. You have to have a separate set of rules for each core if you want to do it correctly, right? So that is memory. It's all brands, you know. You want to preserve that. So we wanted to have one store.com and one copy of the rules. Uh, we wanted to make, and we, we kind of sat and brainstormed. We came up with, you know, 30 ideas of what we wanted to do. But one of the primary ideas we wanted to do is, hey, heck, we're rewriting the whole thing from scratch anyway. Let's rewrite the rule language while we're here. Everyone knows how to write store rules, I would hope. I would hope a good portion of you in this room know how to write store rules, right? Lots of people know how to write store rules. It's kind of the default language that have come up about how to exchange information with each other when you want to detect something on the network. And we're very proud of that. But we knew we could make things easier. We knew that we could make things simpler. So that's what some of my slides are about. Uh, so a little backstory about the, <laughs> I drove from the airport to here. I've been up since 4 o'clock this morning. Um, so let's, let's try this and see if this works. Oh my god. Love it when it works the first time. Snort 3 is an alpha 4. And we're going to go beta probably this year. Okay? My, the only reason we haven't went beta is because of this guy right here, to be quite honest with you. I have dictated the requirement for Snort 3 to go beta is that we have a Snort 3 compatible rule set. It doesn't make you any sense to give you an engine that you can't use without a rule set, right? It's good to be in me. So I said, no, uh, no Snort 3 without, no Snort 3 beta without a rule set. So uh, we released the, we released a Snort 3 compatible community rule set. And those of you that are familiar with the rule sets at Snort.org, we have community, we have registered, and we have subscriber, right? Community is our GPL V2 giveaway for free. Anybody can use it, you can do whatever the heck you want, right? That's, that's the, uh, that's the community rule set. So we took that one because that was the easiest to convert. We converted that one from Stork 2 to Stork 3. There's also a tool within the Stork 3 tarball that allows you to convert Stork 2 rules to Stork 3. Okay, we didn't do it to begin with because it's very, from the Calus perspective, we have to convert 40,000 rules, right? So it's exhausting. And we have to make sure that we don't want to give you anything that's not compatible, right? So um, one of the things that we sat down and we thought about, we're like, hey, we want to rewrite the rule set. How do we rewrite the rule set to make it simpler for people to write rules and make it easier for us to write rules? Because you know, we write the majority of the rules on the internet, and so let's make it simpler for us to do our jobs while we're at it. This is the way a rule looks like today in Snort 3 rule language. I'm not, uh, you know, notice I stripped off all the header and all the metadata stuff, but this is just the content matching stuff, right? You've got your var, which is in an HTTP URI. You've got um, something malicious that's within 20, with also within the HTTP URI. 
What is the redundant thing that you see here besides the word content, right? Is HPURI. So we, in sort three, we started rolling out this concept of what we call sticky buffers. So those of you, again, that have never written a sort rule, know the, probably know the, uh, um, the buffer called file data, right? File underscore data, the keyword, which does a whole bunch of really nifty things. And if you really want to find that out, catch me later. Um, because I still don't think that's well enough explained to the world about what file data does. We decided to make all buffers sticky instead of select ones. You know, and the reason that the, the way that you're able to tell sticky buffers different from non-sticky buffers is that sticky buffers generally come before a match or, or, or a, a section within the rule. Right? So file data, then you do all your content matches. Or SIP, SIP header, right? And you can write all your content matches after that. You know, so everything takes place within the SIP header. So we decided to kind of fix this. And the way that we did this is, is basically this. <laughs> you write HTTP URI one time, and then all of your content matches take place within that buffer after you set that sticky buffer. We did this across the board with every, every keyword. Okay, so it makes things a lot, lot simpler to write. Um, and then there's, there's obviously there's ways to, you know, once you're in a buffer, how to get back out of the buffer, there's ways to do that. But the way that, the reason we did was make, hopefully make your lives simpler. And uh, it, it, is there a learning curve? I don't think so. Th then again, I do this for a living. But, you know, I, I don't think there is. I think once you understand where you need to put the things, like it just becomes second nature. We started to do this internally in the experiments and, and it's working pretty well. <laughs> Um, another thing we wanted to do, so, uh, is we, I'm going to say we stole this from Suricata. We stole, I think we stole the syntax from Suricata. But, um, in stored rules today, if you go into metadata and you type service HTTP, right, within the metadata, if you have a network map defined in the store, it will... <coughs> You know, the auto senses, it doesn't, it doesn't in the product, it doesn't do it in open source. But it will auto figure out what port is HTTP and it will apply those rules to that port, right? So we kind of wanted to bring that logic from the product land over into open source land, the same Suricata did, and, and do the same thing. So we have alert HTTP, and we did this for a ton of different protocols as well. You know, alert HTTP, alert FTP. Um, it operates basically the same. If it figures out what store it is, it applies the rules to that. Nothing, nothing too terribly difficult there. But we went a step further. So we don't, we decided, we're like, hey, do we need the concept of extra left HTTP parts to home that any, right? Anybody that's ever written a store rule knows you have to write this whole header of alert TCP, external net, file data course to home net, it, right? You have to write that whole first line. We decided, do, we, we kind of sat down, we asked ourselves hard questions like, do we need that? What does that do for us, right? Other than indicate direction, right? What does it do and do we need it? So that's one of the things we actually, uh, it's optional. You can write it if you want it, but you don't have to write it anymore. So now you can just write a rule that looks like that. Okay, again, trying to make things simpler. And we're, this will come into play here in a second, a little bit more. So keep breaking this rule down a little bit, right? You got, you're looking for, this is the way that you would generally look for a rule or something malicious in a user agent, right? You know, a little bit of regular expression there at the bottom. And this is the way that you would look for something malicious within the user agent field. Well, we also have something that we wanted to make, other than sticky buffers, is what we call dynamic buffers. And these are buffers that are set at read time when the packet's coming across. We make, a, we make the buffer up. So these are created on demand. Wow, I love this Batman, this is great. Um, <laughs> simplified, these are not my slides. Simplifies many HTTP rules. So what we did, pay attention because I'm gonna you know, click, is this section right here. You see HTTP header, right? There's your sticky buffer. So we know the, H, the rest of that stuff has to take place within the HTTP header buffer. We don't need this, so let's just do this. HTTP header, colon, field, user agent. The field you wanna look up is user agent, and it's in the HTTP header. So we that dynamic buffer is created, like I said, it's created on the fly when the packet's coming across. We 
We don't need that. And content malicious. We get rid of this PCRE. Boop. There's your rule. Don't need the regular expression anymore, which does a bunch of things. You don't have to start the regular expression engine for that rule, which is slow. Those of you that have written stored rules before know that anytime you write a regex, you can, you know, flush your store box to the, down the toilet if you do it wrong. So this is this is that same rule. It's just simplified. And now I have a unicorn. <laughs> this is the greatest ever. Like I've been presenting other people's slides. This is where we actually really wanted to concentrate on. Most attacks nowadays are file-based, right? And when we kind of sat down, we asked ourselves, you know, today, it, like I said, you know, if you ever looked at the store rule set, you know that anytime a, a file is transferred across the network, we generally have to write two rules, one for inbound and one for outbound. And what, so why? Why did we need to do that? So let's just, regardless of protocol, even if it's encoded, you know, if it's inside of a stream, if it's inside of an FTP stream, inside of a download, HTTP, if it's attached to an email, doesn't matter. Why should we have to think about how to do this? this is, we can, we're, this is code, well, we're just typing, right? We don't need to maintain multiple rules. We don't need to create or modify rules. So here is a current rule, okay? You've got, or a couple of current rules. The thing I want you to pay attention to is file data, right? File data sets the buffer of saying, hey, in this particular example, it looks like, well, that's HTTP or file data ports and this is FTP. So we have to write two rules. File data ports is a variable that includes FTP, it includes uh, POP3, it includes IMAP unencrypted, it also includes HTTP, right? And then SMTP servers is your know, mail servers, one port 25. So these are two rules, one for, out, one for coming inbound and one for going outbound. Things I want you to pay attention to. We don't need the two client. We don't need the two server. This is all redundant stuff. Let's get rid of it. Just say alert file. We don't need flow because we don't care which direction it's going. Just alert on the file. And we don't need that whole second rule. That's what a new rule looks like. The headers are optional. Directions are now optional. So you can just write file, alert file, file data, and look for your content. And we can even get even more specific and say file type. We have a keyword called file underscore type. We can say file type PDF, blah. Right? So it only examines PDFs instead of all files. <coughs> we can even get even really technical if we wanted to. We can actually give it a specific version. We can say file type PDF, version 6. So we'll, when it opens up a PDF and it says, PDF is 1.6. You guys have ever looked at inside of a PDF, the version's right in the first several bytes, right? We only have to look at PDFs that are version 1.6. We can do that for browsers. We can do it for a lot of different things. So things, again, simpler. Pause for a Great. <laughs> the, I, I don't know if any of this is exciting to you guys. It, I'm a nerd, so. I've been, you know, we've been working on this for a long time. We wanted to get it right before we unleash it to the masses. The masses, but um, store to Lua is the configuration changer, is the converter. It will take your store.conf and it will convert it over to the new store three uh, version. Uh, it'll also convert your existing rules if you have rules out there, um, so you don't have to completely go in and manually retype all of them. You can just take a file and run it through the converter, and it will spit out store three rules. Um, there's a there's there's a ton of new buffers. There's a ton of new language. There's a ton of new protocols. There's like I said, if you could, if we could, we sat down with Marty, and one of the questions that we asked him was like, if you had to write Snort all over again from scratch, how would you do it? And so it's actually not even in C. It's in C plus oh. plus. My bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, uh, what we need is y'all. We need testers, okay? There's a bunch of them. We have about 
There's about a thousand downloads of Stort 3 a week, which is pretty good for alpha, I think. There's about a downloads, about thousand downloads of Stort 3 a week. Um, but we need people to grab it, use it, configure it, use the rule set, and tell us what's broken. We've there's been a bunch of also, something completely different that we did that, again, you can blame this guy, is all of our development is open. Um, which is, if you're history of Snort 2, you know that all of our code repository for Snort 2 is actually inside of Cisco. It's not on a public Git or anything. Snort 3 is the opposite. It's completely open. It doesn't have any weird licensing restrictions around it. It's GPL v2, the same as Snort. But if you guys remember, the original Snort 3 came out, there was a whole bunch of drama or kerfuffle around. There was, we, we had added additional licensing to the GPL v2, which basically said if you can use Snort for free, but if you're going to use Snort and you're going to charge for it, you need to you know, give us a cut. And so we decided to remove all that language. Um, so now it's just basic GPL v2. Um, why did we not go GPLv3? Because uh, that license is terrible and I hate it. <laughs> uh, I, there's a whole bunch of really good reasons, but you go down the hall and you talk to some of our, our open source lawyers and they really don't like GPLv3. It's like the Richard Stallman like, license. They don't like it. Um, Cisco as a whole doesn't like it. They don't allow anything at Cisco to be licensed GPLv3. So, again, legal issues. Um, trying to think where I would go from here. I mean, it's you know we want you to use it. We want you to we want you to, to download it. We want you to use it. We want you to um, you know check it out. Give it a give it a go. It'll wreck it. It's supposed to. I'm pretty sure, and I have to, I have to test this to, to be quite honest with you, but it's supposed to figure out how many cores you have on your box, and you can specify how many cores you have on your box, and we'll just go use them. Hmm. Right? It's supposed to be smart like that. Like, so, it, it give you, for instance, anybody that's ever configured, like, your memory settings in a store.com? Anybody ever done that? Memory settings, HTTP settings, things like that? You don't have to do that anymore. It figures it out. You don't have to, your mem, cap, all of that nonsense, you don't have to do any of that anymore. It figures it all out for you, based upon the size of the box that it's running. Um, you know, other than that, you know, I could talk about Snort all day, but I figured you're probably bored of hearing about it at this point. Um, what questions can I answer for you guys? Sir? You mentioned the first version of Snort 3 performance was terrible. How about this version? Uh, it's much better. No, I'm sorry, I repeat the question. Uh, he said the, the, the first version of Store 3, because the way we were multi-threading at the time, the performance was terrible. And he said, how is this version? It's much better. I don't have numbers I can release to you yet. We have internal testing, but I'm not comfortable releasing those yet. Suffice to say, they're pretty good. We're pretty happy about it. Sir? Can you be able to benchmark it against Shurikata? So I want to be 110% honest with you. We purposely do not look at Suricata. Um, we don't compare it. We don't look at their code. We don't look at any of their configurations, anything like that. The only reason that we use H alert HTTP is because one of our developers said this would be a smart way of doing it. And I said, hey, I think that's how Suricata does it. But we have a standing policy within Sort within Cisco is that we do not look at Suricata because we do not want to be accused of copying. We do not want to be accused of anything like that, right? So we don't want anybody to come to us and be like, well, you copied that. Like, no, we literally do not. Because it's impossible. We don't, we're not going to look at it. So you said you had a limit of 180 gigs where you have to resolve that version? It's the same question he asked. It's, uh, the, it's the, uh, uh, we're doing very well. Like I said, we have we have internal testing. Uh, I can't I, I can't I can't release the numbers. I'd be 100 percent honest with you. Uh, the numbers are very very good. They are way past what we expected. Way past. Are, are you able to talk any about the, the guts of what how you did the multi-threading? Right? Did you do it with mpitch or did you? So we basically internalized how Sort Two does it today. 
Okay, so how Stork 2 does it today is that you have to have something that's up front of Stork 2, like PF ring, to divide the flows out across the multi cores, right? right? So you have a flow that's per core. Right. So we just did that on steroids, right? Is basically you start storing up, it takes the traffic coming in, it divides it itself. So it, it's, and, and it keeps the flows pinned per core, right? And that's how it analyzes, so that you're never swapping in between cores. Because that's where you lose. That's where you lose performance. So if you have a beefy box, nice amount of RAM, it actually takes less memory than Stork 2 does. But it has a nice amount of RAM, and you have, you can just throw processors at the problem because processors, in a <coughs> large scale things are relatively cheap, right? You can have a hundred core die that's about that big, right? I mean, Cisco makes its own processors, and they're pretty good. Joel, you have one back here in this corner. Sir, you're not allowed to ask questions. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you guys going to put an effort into making the Stork 2 documentation that people who don't have a ton of experience yes. can understand? The question was, are you guys going to do better documentation because your documentation sucks today? Is that what you're <laughs> 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 uh, so, good news is the documentation is built into the engine. So anytime we update the engine, when we write the engine, we have to write documentation in the engine. The engine actually generates the documentation itself. So it's always up to date. Again, we wanted to eliminate, we wanted to eliminate pain points, right? Stork.com serve pain point. Documentations are pain points. Rules are pain points. We wanted to eliminate pain points. So uh, there's actually a command in Stork 3 where you, on the command line, it will dump out the documentation for anything, and you can specify what part of documentation you want. It'll generate an HTML. It does all kinds of really nifty things. Um, so this is along the same rules as this question. For, I don't know how many industry newbies we have here, but I, a couple of years ago, I took a class on Snort. Okay. And um, I had no experience whatsoever in IT, and I remember thinking, what what language am I learning right now? And I don't have any programming background either. Yeah. So what's, the, what's the easiest way to pick up writing school rules? Do I need to take a C class? Or? No, 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 no. Um, no. <laughs> um, the phrase, you jumped into the wrong end of the pool, just went through my head. You know, <laughs> Yeah, C, I mean, it's programming language, right? But store rule language is, is, I mean, you saw it, right? It's basic, it's text, it's English, it's, I'm going to say it's fairly intuitive, but again, I do this for a living. So I'm biased. But, so when I go out, I, I give a lot of talks about different things and store it and open source and things like that. The, one of the feedbacks that I hear is, wow, the store rule language is very confusing. And it's funny because, like, we, not the intention, we've made it, try to make it simple, but, you know, there's also a ton of tricks to writing short rules. Um, but let me, let me just, let me add to you, I'll, I'll get back to it. The ADD, it's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there, there are short rule writing classes that you can take. Um, if you don't want to do that, there's plenty of tutorials online. We have plenty of blog posts on start.org and PDF, stuff like that. It's in documentation as well. If you go to manual.stork.org, it's in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't need to go take a class. I certainly have never taken a class. But again, I've been doing this for 12 years too, so, or 15. But yeah, I, you don't need that. So, quick poll of the room. For those of you that have written Stork Rules before and you saw the Stork Tool, Stork 2, and then you saw Stork 3, is that better? Yeah, it's better, right? Cool. Somebody back here, right there. Yeah. Um, just a little curious about the output side of Snort 3. Uh, does it do JSON output? Is there a unified three? Or <laughs> so there's a unified two. It's not compatible with the current unified two. <laughs> <laughs> it's not compatible with the current unified two. So I don't know whose intelligent decision that was. But now that you reminded me, I'll go fix it. Um, no, there, it does output unified too. 
Um, and the reason that we did that there, uh, because it's, it's kind of a standardized format. We have dumping tools that will dump it out, and you can dump it out in JSON, you can dump it out in whatever. And it's just the reason that we did it Unified 2 is because it's binary, it's very small, and storage is the, is the key. That, and that's the reason that Unified 2 is structured the way it is, because of storage. So we can store lots of it, right? Um, you know, if you want to store it and offload it to separate disks, you can always come back to it later and dump it out in whatever format you want, because it's a standardized format, right? Um, but it's size was the issue. But yes, we have Unified 2 output in Sort 3 that is not compatible with Sort 2. Unified 2 output, so don't get me started on that. I'm sorry? Yeah, you can dump out Unified 2 into JSON. But no, it's not natively in JSON, though. Yeah. So if I understood you earlier correctly. Oh, just a second. Hold on just a second. Is that a requirement? Do you guys want that? Yes. JSON output. All right. So if I understood you correctly earlier, um, you mentioned that uh, there's an organic capability within SNOR 3 where, where I don't need something like GFRing to do flow, flow balancing. Did I understand that correctly? Correct. Awesome. Will that capability allow me to also output to other tool sets if I wanted to? So if I wanted to run that those flows across, like I would today, right, with GFRing across right. a row or something? Same box. I don't know really the answer to your question. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I'll find out. You want to give me your email and I'll, I'll shoot you an email? Yeah. Or you can shoot me an email? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Not a problem. I'll find out for you. In the back. To remove the direction of flow by the rules that requirement, uh, does that substantially change the way the threshold works? Uh, your question is is the threshold change? Yes. Essentially. All right, so how many people have ever written threshold in the rule and you get the alert when the store starts up that says, hey, this is being deprecated, right? <laughs> Obviously, it's being deprecated. We're right on it. It's only been there for, it's only been there for 10 years, so it's cool. Um, you know, we received, we, we were going to remove it, honestly. And the reason that we were going to remove it is because we split threshold into two pieces. Right, is rate limiting and, uh, you know, because basically threshold was a keyword that, that operated on not making rules alert as much, right? And so we thought that there was two parts of this. There's front, there's, there's front of it, there's the back of it. There's prevent rules from alerting until something happens, right? Until it's seen, it, seen the same thing 10 times. Right? And then there's, now that it's happened, how many times do you allow the alert to happen over a period of time? So it was, it's two separate things, which is why we kind of made the decision back then to say threshold is now two different things. It's, it's rate limit and it's and one of the other ones. Um, so we separated those out. And we just, we never, we never removed the keyword. Probably because we received a lot of negative feedback about it, to be quite honest with you. Um, I will tell you. I will tell you one thing. If you guys are happy with something in store, if you guys are unhappy with something in store, if you're unhappy with something that we're, you think we're changing the direction about, if you have questions, the store users mailing list is the best place to do this. The, our developers sit on there. I sit on there. I can. I have a direct channel right into that development pipeline. I can go over to the next. You know, not the next. It used to be the next building. Now it's a floor up. I walk up to the next floor and I can say, hey, people don't like this. Don't do it. <laughs> and then they ignore me. But it's <laughs> 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 it No, it's it's it, no, I mean I, I take that feedback to development meetings and we take that all that stuff into account. And we say, hey, you know, if there's a good reason we're taking something out, or if there's a good reason we're changing changing something. We're going to do a much better job of communicating that to the public and explaining why. That's my mission for this year, is 2018. That's my mission for 2018, is kind of communicate better to the community. Because I feel like for a while, we've kind of kept everybody in the dark, and we need to fix that. So uh, are we going to remove threshold? To be honest with you, I don't even know if the threshold keyword is in Stark 3. It may, we may have taken it out totally. 
But again, we just we split the function of threshold into two different things. So the functionality is there. It's just different keywords. Sir? It's been a while since I've done this, but does sort three keep the idea of rule chaining where if rule one and rule two and rule three, but flow don't bits. flow bits. Thank you. Uh, so yes, flow bits are very integral to how we work. Um, we are hoping the the large majority of the way that we, being Talos, write rules and we write rules, the way that we use flow bits is to pin one side of a flow to a separate side of the flow. Right? You asked for this, I'm returning this. So I saw that this question was asked, and here's the answer coming back from the server. Right? That's how we generally use flow bits. We try really hard not to use flow bits because. It's a it's a configuration like that. We have to be honest with it. Because if you don't have, oh, this rule's on, but that rule's not on, or this rule's on, but that rule's not set, if not checked, checked, if not set. You guys have seen these warnings, I'm sure. Right? That's complicated, and we wanted to stop doing that. So that's one of the reasons that we rewrote the rule language like we did. Right? If you look at alert file, we don't have to set a flow bit that we saw an extension of a rule or a, mat or a file magic a rule and then check that file magic later to see if that file is coming inbound. We just say alert file now. Right? So we're, we're trying to eliminate the use of flow bits as much as we can. But the functionality is still there. Yeah. We just don't want... It's another step that you have to do as a rule writer to look for bad things. Like we need to get the engine out of the way and make it easier for you to do your job. So within, within that file, within that new alert file construct, for example, you can do all of the things you would have done in a separate rule with flow bits. In one rule. that one rule. Yeah. Yeah, like, for instance, if you say alert file, you don't need to say flow to server established, right? So a, a current rule, uh, if you guys have ever looked at the file identify category, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at this nonsense. This was a pet project of mine about four years ago, was writing that entire category which was basically look for the extension of those files. And so our, our rule writers now have a requirement that if we are going to write detection that is inside of a file, it requires six rules to do this. Four rules are just the tracking of the file. Two are now looking for the maliciousness either inbound or outbound, right? Because we look for the file attachment in email, outbound, we look for file attachment in email, web, FTP, and inbound. We look for, what was the other thing? Something else. It's on a completely different protocol that I can't remember because I got up at 4 a.m. And then we write a fourth rule that looks for the file magic of the rule. So if somebody changes the file extension to try and bypass you, we'll still get it with the file magic. And then there's two more rules that you know check the presence of if that flow bit is set. It's a management nightmare for us because then we have to write Six rules for one vulnerability. This, we can only make six with one. Saves us a heck of a lot of time. And it's smarter, and it's staple, and it's, you know, a little bit smarter. Sorry. Where's the Snort 3 user's manual? It's in Snort 3. Only? Yeah. There's no, like, a, you know, like the Snort 2 user's manual? <laughs> There's not. There's not yet. And I can fix that. I think that you very much should, and I don't want to disparage anyone that wrote the Snort 2 user's guide because it was very good, but there were parts in there that were unclear that made writing Snort rules difficult. There are parts in there today that are difficult. What's that? The Snort 3 user's name sucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but I really... No, it's not. Uh, it's funny that, that we was, laugh. Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's funny we laugh and, and because if we don't, we'll go insane, right? We have to laugh because if not, we'll go nuts. Um, I know. I know Story 3. I know the, the user manual is an issue. Um, unfortunately, the people who write the, the rules, the manual, are the same as write code, uh, which is different from how our product operates. We have a whole tech pubs team that writes the manual as opposed to you know the way that we do open source. Um, and C developers are not exactly the most, what's the word I'm looking for? Loquacious? Yeah, nice. It's my Reader's Digest word of the week. Um, 
they're, they're, you know, they're, they're programmers. They don't know how to communicate to humans. So, um, I'm joking, obviously, and they know I'm joking. But it's, uh, we know. We know it's an issue. Um, unfortunately, I'm kind of like in between a rock and a hard place of, do I go back and fix the Snort 2 rules manual, or 2 manual, or do I focus on the future? And, and I keep telling our guys, they're like, oh, we're going we're gonna to release Snort 3, and you know, we're going to deprecate 2, and well, 3 is the future, and 3 is going to be fantastic. I'm like, if you release Snort 3 today, we would support Snort 2 for the next five years. There's absolutely no way we can drop support like that. Oh, yeah, we can. We just, uh, uh, no. <laughs> Stop it. So, I know. I know it's an issue. So, um, uh, unfortunately, my attempts to go over to that building, well, I'm st still thinking of all the candles. They're upstairs now. Um, my attempts to go, over, or to go upstairs and kick them in the teeth have not worked. Um, because they're like, oh, well, you know, yeah, we'll get to the manual right after we write these functions. Um, and so I've actually kind of, uh, I've done this, I'm doing this for Clam AB right now because Clam AB is like, in a, is, you think the Snort 2, you think Snort community is bad, you should come over to Clam AB world. Because uh, this Clam AB world is way worse. So I just uh, hired a guy into my team and I've made him, I'm basically going to make him the community manager for Clam AB and fix that. I, so, um, I want to do the same thing for Snort, is I want to basically hire a community manager just for Snort and one for Clem AV and say, look, I'm a manager now. I, just don't, I don't have the time to do what I used to do, unfortunately. But somebody's got to do it. You know what I mean? It might want a job that I'm accepting resume. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take one more and then. Yeah. One more. Any more? If not, I'm gonna. I have to go. So you got, you got one Sorry. Right here. Last so you mentioned running Snort three on the VP hardware. Yeah. But hardware is cheap. Right? The, the, uh, the use cases can vary, but are there recommended running configurations? Not. We don't. We don't have those yet. We don't because it's still an alpha, right? right? Um, you know, uh, we we designed Snort three to take advantage of hardware accelerator cards. You know, from I mean, there's lots of hardware accelerator cards that are out there. Uh, we designed Storm 3 to take advantage of those. We use them in our product. Um, so we want to make sure that we, you know, code for ourselves as well. Um, but no, we don't have any published recommendations yet. I, I imagine that's something we'll get to when we get more into like a, a solid beta <coughs> stage. But I think we're a little, still too early to start. Again, it's an alpha, right? We need, we need to get the beta. My, my, my hurdle's beta. Once we get there, I'll feel better. But anyway, I'm going to be around for a little bit, and then I have to run and go record a podcast, and I'll be back. So I'm going to go run and check into my hotel, record a podcast, come back. Um, but I'm around. Yeah. Good talk. <laughs>